Amen. I say to you today that there is great peril on this battlefield. There is great peril on the battlefield today. And today's generation, as I've said for about the past month and a half now, today's generation is in dire trouble because the peril of this day is overcoming this generation. In the third chapter of 2 Timothy, from the first through the fifth verse, Paul, he wrote that such a day would come and that such a time it would be filled with men who are lovers of themselves and pleasure rather than the Lord. A scripture that y'all hear me share every now and then. Because again, we are living in that day. Paul, he also wrote in that scripture that men, they would be in that day proud and boastful blasphemers that lack love. Peril is great on this battlefield today. Lastly, Paul, he said that in that scripture, he said to Timothy that such a time, such a day, would be filled with men that have a form of godliness, but denying its power. Peril in the world today on this battlefield. Now Paul's teaching of such a time, it was not something that he made up. It was not something that he came up with by himself. It was not something that he predicted by himself. Paul's teaching of such a time, it came from Jesus's warning about the signs of the times and the end of the age that we find over in the 24th chapter of Matthew's gospel. Where in that scripture, Jesus, he warned his disciples that people in those days, they would need to take heed in order not to be deceived in those days, in times like now. And Jesus, he gave this warning on the note that many would come in his name and that they would say that they, they are Christ. Many today, peril in the world today on this battlefield. History is filled with many kings. It's filled with many emperors, many dictators who saw themselves as gods and as saviors. And I tell you today that if you are an observant child of God, then you should recognize those who see themselves today as gods and as saviors. And you ought to be concerned. Peril on the battlefield today. You see, if you aren't observant, if you aren't aware, let me tell you who they are today. There are those that believe that they have the power to be above everybody. They don't think that anybody should ever hold them accountable for their actions because all of their actions, they are perfect. In their godliness, they, again, they don't think that you can say anything to them because they believe that they are always right. So I say to you today that the peril of today, it is incredibly great because of those that see themselves as gods and as saviors when at the end of the day, they are nothing but imposters. I won't get no amen on that. As history shows us, these false gods and these false saviors, they do nothing but bring about destruction all because of their own selfish ambitions. They don't seek to lift anybody up but themselves. The peril of the day is great. But today's generation, it is one that ignores the peril. It ignores the lessons that has been taught to us by history. It ignores the lessons of the past as it is willing to surrender. It is willing today to surrender its soul to these dangerous imposters. Again, I say to you today that the peril on this battlefield, it is great. So for such a day, we have been taking a look at Peter's encouraging word that we find over in the first chapter of second Peter. 
where again for the past month and a half, we have been taking a look at the fifth and the sixth verse there, where Peter, he encouraged believers to move in a faith that is always growing. Peter, he encouraged believers to, to again add to their faith virtue, to add knowledge to their faith, to add self-control to their faith, to also add perseverance to their faith. Again, we must, in this day and age, where peril is great, we must be growing in our faith on this spiritual battlefield so that we aren't overcome on this battlefield so that we do not lose our soul on this battlefield. So today I want us to look at what Peter said in the sixth, and then we are going to add on the seventh verse, because again, we will see that Peter, he has more encouraging words for us that is fitting for the day in which you and I now live in. We'll see that in the sixth and in the seventh verse there that Peter, he encouraged believers to also add godliness to their faith. He encouraged us to add godliness to our faith along with their brotherly kindness and love. We are to add godliness, brotherly kindness, and we are to add love to our faith. I want to be very clear about this. This is a call for us believers to move in true godliness, not the godliness of the imposters, but again, in true godliness, godliness that is of the Lord, our God. You see, I certainly again, believe that true godliness I believe that that is needed on the spiritual battlefield. I don't know about any of you today, but I believe that godliness, that it is needed in this world. I believe that true godliness is needed in this world. I believe that true godliness, I believe that it is needed in the fight for the soul of this world today. So we have to ask the question and we have to be able to answer the question because somebody somewhere may begin to wonder, well, what is true godliness? Is it what some people believe it is? Is it having absolute power, having absolute authority, authority to where nobody can hold you accountable for your actions, the actions that you take? Is that what godliness is? What is the difference between true godliness and false godliness is what somebody may wonder right now. Well, let's again consider what Paul said there in our response to reading today. Over in the fifth chapter of Romans, let's take a look at what Paul said there in the third through the fifth verse there. We see there in the third through the fifth verse there that Paul, he spoke about glorying in tribulation. We often see that in scripture, don't we? about rejoicing in, in tribulation, about triumphing in tribulation. Paul, he spoke about there, he spoke about how trouble, it produces perseverance. That's something that we saw in, in the last sermon that I preached a couple of weeks ago. He said that trouble, it produces perseverance and perseverance, it produces, Paul said there, character. And then he said there, that character, it produces hope. I want you to underline that. I want you to highlight that in your Bible there. Underline, highlight those verses there. Perseverance, trouble, tribulation, it produces character, and character produces hope. Gaining character and hope through our troubles, through our tribulations, that's something that it really sticks out to me. I know about all of you, but that sticks out to me. Now you may begin to wonder, well, pastor, why does that stick out to you? Well, let's consider this today. What is the character of the sincere believer? What is your character? What is it supposed to be? How are you supposed to move? How are you supposed to live in this world today? Well, I will tell you today that the character of the sincere believer, it should be godliness. Should it not? It should be godliness 
But again, what is godliness? Well, godliness is exactly what it sounds like. It is to be godlike. Now, I need to bring some clarity to that statement. I need to bring some understanding to that statement. I don't want there to be any confusion about what it means to be godlike. So for clarity and for understanding purposes here, we are to live, we are to move in a godlike manner, but not live as if we are a god. Again, I want you to understand today, there is a difference in the two. Somebody may wonder, well, pastor, what's the difference? It sounds like you may have said the same thing. Well, I tell you today, one is trying to imitate the way of God while the other thinks he is or she is a God. And again, like I said, there is a difference. The difference being is that one is sinful and the other, it ain't sinful. We are called on to live in a Christ-like manner. And the fact of the matter is, is that no man can be God. The last I check, and I hope that you all will agree me, with me on this, there is only one God. Amen. I got an amen there, so y'all agree with me. There's only one God that sits high and looks low. And I tell you today, that ain't me. I don't sit high and I don't look low. I'm just down here with the rest of y'all. So let me tell y'all this right now. For all y'all that think y'all guys out there, there ain't number one God and it ain't you. You see, we can't be guys because again, we are all fallible creatures. We have a nature that is of sin. We have a nature to sin. In other words, we will sin. Last time I checked, my God is perfect. He don't sin. But sadly, there are many blasphemers and many participating in idolatry today, going around worshiping a calf of gold. Uh oh, somebody ain't gonna like that. I don't care. Everything he commands, they will do and obey without batting an eye. Uh oh. And what's scary about this is that many of them that are participating in the idolatry of today are those that like to profess that they are a child of God. They go and they sit in the church every Sunday. And if their church have a Bible study on Wednesday, they are there. They want to be there so that they can leave out and say, hey, I'm a Christian. But then they go around and they participate in the idolatry of today. Oh, boy. I warn you today. I warn all of those today who have the same pride as Satan, to lift themselves up above God, I warn you today that you will fall, just as he did. And then on top of that, all of those who are following those who think that they are gods today, you will fall right along with them. They will bring you down to the grave to eternal condemnation. So you better turn around. You better turn around from their, their false godliness for true godliness, for following the Lord. And again, if you are the one that is moving in false godliness today, I tell you today, you better stop. Because you don't want none of the true God. And so we must move in true godliness today. Not that is not that which is false, not that which is an imposter. So in order for us to understand what true godliness is, in order for us to understand the character, as Paul said there, the character of true godliness, guess who we must take a look at? It certainly ain't me. <laughs> it, 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 it certainly ain't nobody else in the world today. In order for us to understand and know what true godliness is, we must take a look at God himself. Yes, God, he is all powerful, but how he moves in his power, that is what we must learn. We must learn how he moves in his power so that we can be better imitators 
in the Christ-like, in the God-like manner in which we are to live in. Because again, I tell you, it is needed on this battlefield today. So let's take a look at how it is that the Lord moves. Let's start off by taking a look at the foundation of God's character. What is the foundation of God's character? Well, John, he said in first John, the fourth chapter and the eighth verse, John, he said that God is love. How many of us know that the Lord is love today? You see, God, he has demonstrated his love throughout scripture. And I would tell you that the Lord, he still demonstrates his love for all of us today. All you have to do is open up your eyes and you will see it. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I tell you today, let's think about it here for a moment. If you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, and I've been referencing this scripture for the past two years now. If you take a look at the 26th verse in the first chapter of Genesis, we can see God's love plain and clear for us. Where in his love, God, he chose to create us. He chose to create mankind in his image and in his likeness. The one who again sits high and sits low. He created us in his image and his likeness. He did not have to do that. He could have made us just like how he made the animals, just like he made our favorite pets. He could have made us like the vegetables that we consume, but he didn't do that. Then on top of that, rather than putting mankind in a desert, in a barren, in a desolate land, look at the world. Imagine what it was all the way back then before we destroyed the world. God put man in a fully furnished world, didn't he? Sounds like love to me. I don't know what y'all think it is, but it sounds like love to me. And, and if you think about it even more, God, he put man in the garden. Adam and Eve, they were in a garden, and guess what? They didn't have to do any kind of work. They didn't have to break a sweat. They didn't have to labor for anything. I saw how you did your eyes, D, because you thought about how you just had, how you have to go to work. And you probably was thinking like how the rest of us do, man. If it wasn't for them, I could have just been in the garden. <laughs> Sounds like love to me, though. That, that man, when, when God created man, he put man in the garden, they didn't have to do no kind of work. Sounds like love to me. Imagine being born into that kind of world. Then over in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul, he further expounded on the character of love by talking about God's love as a foundation. In the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians in the 7th verse, Paul, he wrote that love, Therefore, godliness, Paul said that it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Therefore, springing from the foundation of love is faith, hope, and mercy. Godliness. After man's fall to sin in the garden, again, we can see the godliness of our God. Think about how it is that the Lord moved after man's fall in, in the garden. You see, the Lord, he moved first in faithfulness. You see, in the garden, God, he promised to defeat Satan in sin. We often consider that he made this promise for us in defeating Satan and sin. But God, I want you to understand, he made that promise for himself as well. You see, God, he had to make a promise for himself as well because there is nobody that can hold himself accountable. He has to hold himself accountable. So God, he made the promise of salvation to us, but he had to make the promise to himself 
so that he would keep what he promised to himself because God, he cannot deny himself. He must be faithful. Talking about godliness here today. Was he faithful to what he promised? I believe so. Did he not give us, did he not give the world his only begotten son? As Paul said there in the scripture of my response reading for today, as he said there in the sixth verse, he said, when we were still without strength, Christ, he died for the ungodly. Guess who the ungodly is? So God, again, he had to keep his promise. As Paul said to Timothy, in his sovereign power, God, he holds himself accountable and he cannot deny himself. He can't lie. So here's what we must answer today. Is such love, it is, at, is it at the foundation of who we are? Is it at the foundation of our character? In these times of peril, are we moving out of love? Are we moving out of faith? It's what we must answer today. Are we being faithful to ourselves? Are we being faithful to each other? Are we being faithful to the Lord? See, we made a promise. We committed ourselves to living in the way of God. Hold yourself accountable today and answer. Are you living in the way of God? You said that you would live in the way. Have you kept that vow? Did you do ask Hannah? As we saw in our Sunday school lesson for today. In his response to man falling in the garden, we see again his character, God's character. When man fell to sin in the garden, did he give up on mankind? No. Going all the way, looking back to the days of Noah, when, when the world's sin, when mankind's sin was so great, did God, did he give up on mankind? You know, I got a grumbled no. When Israel, when they worship that, that calf of gold, like I said, many people are doing today. After they made a promise, they made a covenant with the Lord. They said that they would keep the law, but they broke it by dancing and worshiping and praising that calf of gold. Did he, did God give up on them? Yes, when mankind fell to sin in the garden, mankind was kicked out of the garden. However, again, the Lord, he, he promised. He made a promise that one day we will return back to that garden, the garden in his kingdom. Don't sound like he gave up on us, not to me. Yes, during the day of Noah, the Lord, he sent a great flood but we know of Noah because the Lord saved Noah and his family. This sound, doesn't sound like God gave up on mankind to me. Yeah, when Israel worshiped that calf of gold, the Lord was frustrated. The Lord was upset with them. But again, God, he gave them another opportunity to follow him, to follow that cloud by day, that fire by night to the promised land. And he brought them to the promised land, though one generation was so wicked that they wasn't able to enter in, but they eventually entered in. God didn't give up on them, did he? Has God ever given up on you in your sin? You might think that he does, but God, again, he loves you. And he is faithful to you. Talking about his character, talking about true godliness here. God, he doesn't give up on us because he hasn't lost hope in us. <clears throat> the hope that God has in us is honestly, it's the most remarkable thing I find about his love. The fact that God has not given up on me 
in my sins, in the errors of my word, my way, because I am far from perfect. Do you know how it makes me feel knowing that God still believes in me? How does it make you feel to know that God still believes in you, that God has not lost hope in you? God still believes in us, even in all of our failures. When we would give up on ourselves, God hasn't given up on us. In the 29th chapter of Jeremiah, when the Jews, when they were living in captivity in Babylon, Jeremiah, he wrote them a letter from the Lord. Judah, they was living in captivity in Babylon because, again, that was a judgment of their sinful living because they chose to turn away from the Lord for worshiping idols, for worshiping false gods, living in sin. In the book of Lamentation, it shows us how sad and how depressing those days were. It could almost feel like all hope was lost for them. But there in the 29th chapter of Jeremiah, while it may have seen that God had given up on them, we see that the opposite was true. Because the Lord said there in the fifth verse in the 29th chapter of Jeremiah, the Lord, he encouraged the people to build houses and to build gardens, even though they were in captivity. God, he encouraged the people to get married and to have families. The Lord, he again made a promise to those that were living in exile at that time. He said to them that he has a designated time that they would be delivered from their captivity. Again, God, he did not give up on them when many of us would have gave up on them right away. From these encouraging words to those in captivity, again, we see that God, he does not lose hope. He does not lose hope in us. Talking again about his character. God said that his thoughts towards us, towards them, that they were of peace and not evil, even though they had sinned. God says the same thing to all of us today. God said that his thoughts towards them were to give them a future and to give them a hope. He says the same thing to us today. You often hear me quote Jeremiah, the 29th chapter and 11th verse, because I am a big believer in that there is always hope. And the reason why I am a big believer that there is always hope, because my hope is rest in the Lord. I know what God has done for me. I know all that the Lord has brought me through. And I am a big believer that there is always hope. Do you all, do you believe the same today? And so as Paul said there in, in my key verse there, he said there that God, he poured out his love in our hearts through the giving of his only begotten son. And so because we have believed in his only begotten son, we have received the Holy Spirit. Not only have we received the Holy Spirit, we have received the fullness of the Lord. We have received his hope. His hope, it lives in us. His hope, it dwells in us. So therefore, our character today, it should be made up of, guess what? Hope. Are you hopeful in this world that we live in today, in this time of peril? Do you have hope or have you lost hope? Many people are losing hope today. So I repeat to you today that God, he's a God of love from which there is faith and hope. And if God's character is of faith, hope, and love, guess what your character is? Guess what true godliness, guess what it is made up of? Again, faith, hope, and love. True godliness, it should imitate God's faith. It should imitate God's hope. It should imitate God's love, and it should do so at all times. So again, in these perilous times, it is of the utmost importance that you that you live in true godliness, that you move in faith, 
that you move in love and that you never lose hope. I say to you today that it is incredibly important that you don't lose hope today. Even though there is peril in the world today, I tell you again today, you better not lose hope. Do not lose hope. Do you understand why it is important for you today to remain hopeful? even when it seems that all hope is lost. You see, it is important that we remain hopeful today because so many people, they are losing hope. They are losing hope today in the face of all of this false godliness that's going around in our world today. But you see, I tell you that Jesus, he called on us true believers to be lights in this world today. We ought to be lights, beacons of hope in this world today. And Jesus, he called on believers to be as a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Again, we are to be hope in this world today. Yeah, Paul, he said that in my key verse today, he said that hope does not disappoint. He said there. Again, I want you to stop and I want you to think about what that means here for a second today. What does it mean that hope does not disappoint? Well, as I said just a few minutes ago, there is always hope. And again, the reason why there is always hope is because our hope is in the Lord. God, he still lives today. God, he hasn't gone away. The Lord, he is still in the world today. So again, I tell you today that there is always hope. My hope is in the Lord. What about you? Is God your hope today? You see, Christ, he should be your hope in that he gave everything for you. He gave everything for you. Though we may have tribulation, Jesus said that in him we have peace of mind because he has overcame the world. Do you believe it today? Mm -hmm. I want you to seriously consider what it means that you have faith in the one that has overcome this world. This world of peril, this world of tribulation, this world of affliction, this world of sin. Think about what that means, that you have faith and that you have hope and the one that has overcome all of the wickedness and the evil of this world. Why should you be moved today by the growing evil and wickedness of the world today? Why should you be moved today by the peril that's in the world today? You see, who would you be today if your hope was not in the Lord? You see, personally, I would be dead in sin. I'll be dead in sin, both physically and spiritually. Let me tell you. You see, I would have fallen. I would have fallen a a long time ago to envy, to lust, to jealousy, to greed, to covetousness. I would have fallen a long time ago. My anger, it would have gotten the best of me. I would have went out and did something foolish, something that I would not have regretted. And in all of it, I'd be awaiting my judgment today. I'd be waiting the judgment of my wicked actions. I'd be waiting the judgment of eternal condemnation. If it had not been for God giving the world, giving me his only begotten son. If it had not been for God not giving up on me, I'd be lost if my hope was not in the Lord, but I'm not lost today. Where would you be if it wasn't for the Lord on your side? And if God was not on my side, I would have given up a long time ago. When my dad died, I would have gave up. I would just threw my hands up in the air, gave up. When I got kidney failure. When my kidneys tried to take me out, then I had to sit in that dialysis center for nearly a year. 
Then I had to do it in, in home. Mom had to be there with me. Hours upon hours. I would have, again, given up. Again, I would be sitting and waiting judgment because I gave up. I'd be waiting the judgment of my eternal condemnation if it had not been for the Lord on my side. If he had not given me, the world, his only begotten son for me to have hope in. I tell you today, I would not have made it through. I made it through today because my hope is in God. Because God has always been there for me. Because God has always brought me through. What about you today? You see, we can go nowhere without hope. We can't do anything without hope. We can't accomplish anything without hope. We certainly can't overcome our trials, our tribulations. We can't overcome our afflictions. We can't overcome our aches and our pains, our, our worries, our stress, our fears, and our anxieties if we don't have hope in the Lord. Without hope in God, you cannot ever think of receiving your blessings. Therefore, you can't be blessed if you don't have hope in the Lord. Without hope in the Lord, you would truly be hopeless. And you will be consumed in these days of peril. Lost to eternal condemnation is, again, why it is so important for you to remain hopeful, even when it seems that all hope is lost. And again, on top of that, even more, we as God's children, we are to be as a city on the hill. Again, we are to be that beacon of hope in the world today. If we lose hope, this world is in trouble. If we lose hope, our brothers and our sisters, they are in trouble. If we lose hope, our cousins, they are in trouble. If we lose hope, our friends and our acquaintances, they are in trouble. If the believer lose hope today, the stranger is in trouble. What? We cannot lose hope today. Amen. Regardless of the peril of this day, I tell you, I won't be losing hope. Amen. Again, I want to repeat that one more time for you. And again, I said that without batting an eye without flinching, regardless of what's going on in this world, regardless of what's going on around me or with me, I tell you today, I will not lose hope. What about you? You see, when we did not have, guess what God did? He provided for us, didn't he? When we did not know how we will make it, guess what happened? The Lord he brought us through, didn't he? God, he sustained us, didn't he? We as a people, we have been in difficult times before, haven't we? But guess what happened? God, he again brought us through, didn't he? God didn't give up on us, did he? Since we know a thing or two about perseverance and because we know that God hasn't given up on us, we, therefore, then, we should never give up on him, should we? Amen. We should never be so quick to give up on him. But why are we quick to give up on the Lord today? I don't understand it. We believers, we should have a never give up spirit, a never give up attitude, a never give up character is what we should have. Because, again, God has never given up on us. If God is going to keep on pushing forward, guess what we should be doing? We should be right there behind him, pushing on forward with him. You see, when we remain hopeful, I tell you today that it will lift us up. But not only will it lift us up, it will lift our brothers up. It'll lift our sisters up. It'll lift our mothers, our fathers up. It'll lift our cousins up. It'll lift our friends, our acquaintances, all of those around us will be lifted up as well. To you today who are losing hope because of what may be going on, what you may see on the TV, what you may see on the internet today, 
I tell you today, in these times of peril, don't you do it. I am encouraging you today not to give up. Don't give in to the imposters and their false godliness today. To those who think that they are guys, don't you succumb to them. Don't you surrender to them today. You see, they want you to feel hopeless. They want you to give up. You see, they are agents of the devil. And guess what? He definitely wants you to give up today. They want you to feel hopeless as they continue to try to impose their will on you and the rest of the world. But again, I tell you that there's only one God. He sits high and he looks low. And so again, I tell you today, remain hopeful in him when all hope seems lost. God, he is a God of hope. He's a God of faith. He's a God of love. Never give up on him. Again, we must remember that all things work together for good for all of us who love the Lord. Regardless of what it is that you may be going through, again, just know all things work together for good because you love the Lord. Yes, the world is filled with evil men. Yes, the world is filled with imposters, which Paul predicted would grow worse and worse. However, we are encouraged to continue in the hope of what we have learned, to continue in the hope of what we have been assured of through Christ. And Christ, he assured us that we can overcome because he overcame. And so the evil men and imposters, they will, yes, grow more and more today. But as Paul told Timothy over in the third chapter of 2 Timothy, and the ninth verse, Paul said that those imposters, those who are of false godliness, Paul said that they will progress no further than their mortality. They are not immortal. They are not gods. However, when we continue in the hope of our God, when we live in true godliness today, Scripture shows us that there will be a day when we will be just as our Lord in the kingdom of heaven. When we join him in the kingdom of heaven, as it is shown to us in the book of the revelation of Christ. So again, I encourage you today, continue forward today in the hope of true godliness. Continue forward in the hope of true godliness as we have been equipped for every good work to save souls in this day and in this age, in this time of peril. Continue forward in hope, knowing again that you will reach the finish line. You will make it on this journey. You will reach the gates of the kingdom of heaven and you will enter in into the kingdom of heaven. Again, you will overcome the evil and the wickedness of this day. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's message and I hope that you'll share it with someone somewhere. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you like this video, follow the channel as well as hit the alert bell so that you don't miss any notifications so that you don't miss any of the wonderful videos that we share here on the Newfound Faith YouTube channel.